What if you could learn to fluently speak a new language in a few months, complete a computer science degree in one year instead of four, or acquire a PhD while working full time? There's a world of learners out there who manage to achieve the seemingly impossible by utilizing strategies that all of us can incorporate into our lives. Hi friends, welcome to Book Buddies, a series where I talk about the key insights from books I've read. Today we'll be talking about Ultra Learning by Scott Young, which is by far one of my favorite books on how to learn. It's essentially a field guide on the best practices for rapid skill acquisition. If you're interested, I've linked my in-depth notes below. In the book, Scott Young explores the cognitive science tools and tactics utilized to achieve these incredible results and combines them with his own experience from completing MIT's four-year undergraduate computer science degree in one year to learning four languages to fluency in a single year. Ultra learning is defined as a strategy for acquiring skills that is both self-directed and aggressive. It is one of many strategies, and as Young puts it, it will stretch you. So if you're not quite ready for something so intense, this might not be for you. From research and interviews with fellow ultra learners, Young has discovered that there are nine principles that everyone who rapidly acquires skills follows. The first is meta-learning, which is learning how to learn the skill at hand. It means seeing how the subject works, what kinds of skills and information must be mastered, and what methods are available to do so more effectively. You'll want to have really narrowed your learning goal to its approximate scope. If you find out later that the scope is too narrow, you can always expand it. Instead of something overly broad like learn how to program, you should narrow it down to learn enough CSS, HTML, and JavaScript to build a to-do list app. A general rule Young suggests is spending 10% of your expected learning time on research. So if you're planning on spending 10 hours per week for 15 weeks, you should spend about 15 hours researching. You'll want to look for the primary resources you're going to use, so books, videos, lectures, classes. A good place to start is to look at how other people who've acquired the skill did so. You can generally find these in online forums like Reddit, blog posts, boot camps, and even traditional educational institutions. And if you want extra credit, you should consider reaching out to these peoples over email or any means possible and trying to interview them for tips. You'll want to continue to revisit and tweak this map throughout the duration of your project. Once you have the initial version of the map, you'll want to figure out how to focus and learn how to cultivate your concentration. Because of the intensity of ultra learning projects, it's really easy to succumb to distractions or procrastinate even starting. In general, you'll need to even realize you're procrastinating in the first place before using tactics to force yourself to concentrate, like setting aside time in your calendar for learning. As you're learning, you should make sure that you're engaging in deliberate practice. Here's a clip of K. Anders Ericsson, one of the leading scientists behind expertise, talking about what that is. When we look at people who are really reaching a very high level, they're working with their teachers who identify something that they specifically would want to improve with respect to their performance. And then they engage in some kind of training activity that tries to hone that particular aspect. So for us, deliberate practice requires that the teacher would be able to look at your performance and then say, at your current level of performance, here's an aspect that you can improve in the next couple of weeks. And also tell you about what kind of training activity should you engage in in order to reach that new level of performance. The actual learning itself should feel uncomfortable, like you're working at the edge of your ability. As you're learning, it's important that your learning should be tied as closely as possible to the situation or context that you'll be using it in, which is the third principle, directness. If you want to get better at deadlifting, you don't want to just read about deadlifting. You actually have to go pick up some weights. I often find myself gravitating towards reading or watching lectures because it's easier. But the problem with this is that learning something often depends on the tiny details of how that knowledge interacts with reality. By learning in a real context, you also acquire many of the hidden details or skills that make it a lot easier to transfer that information from the artificial setting of a classroom to a real life situation. A few examples of tactics you can use are building projects for applied skills like art or design, or if you're pursuing an academic interest, writing something like a thesis paper. The fourth principle of ultra learning is drill. Whenever you learn something, you'll start running into bottlenecks. With language learning, this could be the number of words you know, or with programming, it could be the syntax. It's important that you design drills to target these bottlenecks, as your overall rate of learning is going to be constrained by those bottlenecks. It doesn't matter how good your Mandarin grammar is, if you don't know enough words, you won't be able to have a decent conversation with anyone. You'll want to focus on removing these bottlenecks using drills. These could be anything from using flashcards to increase your vocabulary, to trying to rewrite articles from your favorite magazine, which is something Benjamin Franklin did to improve his persuasive writing ability. The fifth principle of ultra learning is retrieval. Do you ever wonder how much of what you're learning actually sticks? This is a question Jeffrey Karpiki and Janelle Blunt tried to figure out 
by examining how students performed after using different study methods. Students were split into four groups, and each group was given the same amount of time to study, but told to use different study strategies. Reviewing the text a single time, reviewing the text multiple times, free recall, so attempting to remember as much information from what they just read by closing the book, and concept mapping. The students were then asked to predict how they'd do in the upcoming test. Those who did repeated reviewing predicted that they'd do the best, followed by the single review, followed by concept mapping, and the people who did free recall thought they'd do the worst. But the results weren't even close. The free recall group performed almost 50% better on questions related directly to the text. A general heuristic is that free recall tests are better than cued recall tests, so tests where you're given hints, which are better than recognition tests, so multiple choice. The next principle is one of the most consistent aspects of strategy ultra learners use, and that's feedback. Often, what separates ultra learning methods from more conventional approaches is the immediacy, accuracy, and intensity of feedback provided. You'll want to look for practice methods that allow you to get a ton of actionable feedback. When it comes to feedback, one thing I've always struggled with is trying to figure out what good feedback looks like and what bad feedback looks like. Two researchers, Abraham Kluger and Angelo Denisi, looked at hundreds of research studies to try and figure out how feedback affected learning. The overall effect of feedback was positive, but in over 38% of cases, feedback actually had a negative impact. They found that feedback works well when it provides useful information that can guide future learning. So things like what you're doing wrong and how you can fix it and it backfires when it's aimed at a person's ego. So praise, for example, is actually detrimental to further learning. When feedback steers into evaluations of you as a person, it actually has a negative impact on your learning. Even feedback that includes useful information needs to be correctly processed as a motivator for future learning. In fact, the most important thing is how the learner decides to use that feedback. Ultra learners need to be on guard for two possibilities when receiving feedback. You don't want to overreact to feedback that doesn't provide specific information on how to improve, or if it conflicts with deeply held beliefs. Also, don't let overly positive or negative feedback affect your motivation. That doesn't mean giving yourself an excuse not to process feedback. It just means pushing back for the right level of feedback for your current level of learning. Remember, Fear of feedback is often much more uncomfortable than receiving the feedback itself. One thing to note about feedback is that you can't force it. What that means is that you can't expect someone who's not an expert to give you expert advice on something. So if you're learning web design and you ask someone to look at your website, they might say that the background color feels weird or the font feels off, but really they're trying to get at some other thing which they can't quite articulate because they don't have the necessary knowledge to be able to give you good feedback. Let's talk about retention. Back in the 1880s, Herman Ebbinghaus ran a series of experiments on memory and ended up discovering the forgetting curve. He found that most of our memories decay at an exponential rate and that the rate at which we forget things tapers off over time. And most interestingly, that that rate of forgetting decreases every single time we remember something correctly. There are two reasons why memory is crucial to learning. The first is that memory is often a bottleneck to learning. It doesn't matter how good your Japanese grammar is, if you only know 100 words, you're not going to be able to write beautiful Japanese poetry. And secondly, how do we ensure that we haven't wasted our time learning something that we're just going to forget in a year? The most well-researched way of remembering things is to space your learning out over more intervals over longer periods of time. This might cause somewhat lower performance in the short run because you'll end up forgetting things in between the intervals, but much better performance in the long run. So you'll generally want to study one hour over 10 days instead of 10 hours over one day. There are tons of methods for spacing. So space repetition software like Anki is very popular or simply trying to remember things after you've read them or even semi-regular projects and practice. The eighth principle is intuition, which is often cited as a sign that you really know something inside and out. So how do you develop intuition? Simply studying something for a long period of time likely isn't the answer. Famed physicist and prankster Richard Feynman used to demonstrate the brittleness of his students' knowledge by asking them questions that weren't in the textbook to show that they didn't have a true deep understanding of what they'd been learning. One of Young's favorite methods for developing intuition is to use what he dubs the Feynman technique. I'll link to a deep dive on how to use the Feynman technique up here. Broadly, the way the Feynman technique works is by imagining you're explaining something to a complete beginner. And every time you come across something you can't quite explain, referring back to your study notes or your study resources, 
and then continuing to do that until you can explain the entire concept. The final principle of ultra learning is experimentation. When you first start learning a skill, it's sufficient to follow in the steps of someone who's slightly further along than you. But as your skill develops and you find yourself on terrain that is less well trodden, you'll need to start to experiment to find your own path. If you don't start experimenting at this point, you'll probably see your skills stagnating because you'll just be going over stuff that you already know. There are tons of ways to experiment. You can do things like introducing constraints. So if you're a filmmaker, you may try to only shoot films that are 60 seconds or shorter. Or if you're trying to improve your storytelling ability, to only let yourself use a smartphone. Another way to experiment is to emulate experts. So if you're an artist, attempting to recreate Van Gogh's paintings, for example. When you start an ultra learning project, you'll want to make sure that your project hits those nine principles. And as you progress along a learning path, you'll want to take a step back every now and again to reassess and ask yourself, is this project still meeting those nine principles? Ultra learning is an iterative process, and it's a skill that you acquire over a lifetime. The more projects you take up, the better you'll get at it. So there you have it, ultra learning in a nutshell. I'm only touching a sliver of what the book covers, and the book itself goes into way more depth on the different tools and tactics you can use to implement each of those nine principles. So if you're interested, I've included a link to the book below. Also, check out Scott's amazing YouTube channel where you can watch him learn everything from quantum mechanics to Macedonian super quickly. Thanks for watching and see you next time.